Welcome back to the Wingspan Podcast, episode 41. I'm Doug Barak, joined by my co-host Chris Mahal and Ned Staley, and our special guest. He's the host of the Mike Delivers Podcast. Welcome, Mike Bezeglia, to the podcast. Thank you for taking some day, time out of your morning to join Doug and I. What's going on, man? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you guys for uh, for having me on. Looking forward to talking a little Uber Eats stories, talk a little Brooklyn Nets, talk a little New Jersey Nets, anything else y'all want to get into. So uh, thank you guys for having me. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Of Glad course, and we appreciate you coming on. So I guess we'll kick it off with what you've been up to since COVID started. Yeah, a lot, a lot's gone on. Um, I think that's probably the case for a lot of people. But um, COVID started, and I, I'll just, I'll flat out start with this. Um, it was early March. Got COVID. Uh, gave it to my wife, who was pregnant at the time. And this was before people really understood or knew a lot about what was COVID at all. Uh, and I remember being a little nervous about it, scared. Uh, fought through it was good. Um, so I'll start off with that. So that was a pain in the ass. And then um, September rolled around. I ha- my wife and I had our first baby, uh, Ryan Biseglia. He's uh, thank you very much. I appreciate congrats, that. Congrats. And at that point, I was like, I don't want to commute into New York City anymore. So I quit CBS Sports Radio. I've been doing more of my own podcast thing, uh, working for a podcast network on the side, doing more Uber Eats, and that's that's been it. So yeah, this. A couple of things have been going on. Yeah, for sure. So I just want to apologize for my look. My webcam's out of wax. I'm frozen in like a decent uh, situation right now. So I'm just going to roll with it. I think you look solid. I, That's I, what I, I think, said. I, I yeah. was telling him. I said he froze in a good spot overall. It's not like that bad. Yeah, I'm no, like, the, like I'll, I'll try to freeze right now for you. Like I'm like, <laughs> you know, sticking my tongue out. I'm, I'm, I'm like, think, the, I'm like the opposite of those paintings in Harry Potter. Like. They're the ones talking and moving, and yet I, I can't. Damn. But anyway, so you brought it up a little. Um, you summed it up a bit, but can you talk about your journey from where you are today as a whole, like what college you go to, your first producer position or internship or relevant position uh, working as producer slash content creator, and was that always a dream and focus of yours? Yeah, no, that's a good question. And uh, I went to Syracuse University, and I wanted to be into the broadcast uh, gimmick, get into all of that fun. Um so I did that. I went to Syracuse University, and I did always kind of want to be into broadcasting. I remember doing play-by-play. I went to the All-Star Game. I think it, I can't remember if it was the Orlando All-Star Game or the Utah All-Star Game in, like, 91, 92. And they had this TV, and you could sync up doing play-by-play to it. So I believe it was the Jordan shot versus Craig Elo, and you could record yourself doing the play-by-play. And I'm probably like eight, nine years old or something. And I did that. I loved it. And I kind of got the itch to do that. Uh, And then I kind of got hooked on sports radio. Listened to WFAN growing up and kind of wanted to get involved in that. So I went to um, went to Syracuse for a degree in broadcast journalism. Uh, And I was probably really bad at all of the TV stuff that was involved in it. Really had no idea what I was doing. Uh, It was a utter disaster. I will say, which was pretty cool, my freshman year at Syracuse, was Carmelo Anthony's freshman year, uh, the year they went to the national championship. So that was a lot of fun. That ride was pretty incredible and special. Uh, But I'll say getting back to my journey, I remember my senior year of college, we had a substitute teacher for one of our TV classes. And he was like, all right, if you can't get a TV job, it's going to be difficult over the summer. Here's an idea. Why don't you drive down the coast or drive anywhere you want to go and hand off your TV tapes and go into these TV stations? I was like, okay. That's a decent idea. Get out of the house. So I did that with my cousin and we drove from Virginia, Georgia, North Carolina, went to all these different states and I dropped off my resume tapes. Um, Actually had an interview in Bowling Green, Kentucky, did not get the job. But one of the places that I went through was Charlottesville, Virginia, which was one of my favorite places on earth. Love Charlottesville. It's like my second home. So I stopped there. My buddy was actually going to move there, one of my best friends, because he wanted to be with his girlfriend who was a senior at the time. So I started working at Charlottesville. Uh, I worked at a store called Mincers, where I store overpriced hoodies and sweatshirts and T-shirts. And from there, just kept kind of bugging my way into the local radio station, which I eventually did. Screen calls for the morning show. Found my way working for the um, UVA uh, basketball team in the arena, did the instant replay, cut the instant replay. So I did a little bit of that until eventually got a full-time gig uh, hosting, producing, 
and pretty much doing everything when you're in Charlottesville and got to call UVA baseball play by play. It was an amazing experience. Um, I kind of did that for six, seven years. And then I heard CBS Sports Radio was um, starting up back in New York, had some connections there from interning at the fan. And uh, away I went and got my door at CBS Sports Radio. So that that's uh, that's the two minute version of my life. That's pretty impressive, and it's nice yeah, to have that kind impressive. of connections. You know, cues you get. Iron Eagle, and you said UVA. So Joe Harris, if I'm not mistaken. So it's mm. nice, you know, think Yo, about it that way. I love Joe. I mean, I saw Joe when I ran the Virginia Sports Network. Joe was in college, and Joe, like, I mean, to see his development today, I'm like goo goo gaga for him. Like, I'm in love with the guy. Anytime I'm, to see where. He was when he got to the university with Tony Bennett and to see his development from freshman year to senior year and now turning into a guy that's making $18 million a year on a championship contender who's a key piece to the team. Uh, I mean, like Joe, uh, if, if Joe left this summer or I guess this this winter or whatever, wherever the offseason was, it would have crushed me. It really would have crushed me. Oh, for sure. I mean, it's <laughs> it's kind of nice by association that you were there at the same time he was. So perhaps he should, you know, slide you a bonus. I uh, I would I would appreciate that. I mean, I, I we could probably get into this later, but like Joe to me, being like the foodie he is, UVA connections, Nets connections, uh, everything about him. I'm just like, let's chat it up, Joe. I see where we're going with this later on. <laughs> Yeah, we're, we're definitely going to dive in this later on. But getting back to your journey and everything. So, obviously, you had that type of – you had to go out of your way. Like you said, you're handing out tapes, T-shirts, yeah. and everything. So, who were some of your mentors in that process? Or was this kind of an individual journey? That really was just me on that side of things, getting there. Um, you know, that was – like I said, I, I went there, and this was a substitute teacher that gave this idea. But once I got to Charlottesville – I would say uh, a couple of people were key it was Jay James. He was the program director for News Radio 1070 WINA. And then he hosted the sports show called Best Seat in the House. And I'm so grateful because he allowed me to produce, host shows, go out on the field and interview players and just do things that, I, to be quite honest, like when I was in college, I was probably too insecure and nervous to do. I loved my time at Syracuse, but I was intimidated by a lot of the other students there. And I was too scared to really get my feet wet, uh, to be cliche about it. But once I got to Virginia and I grew up a little bit, Jay was so instrumental in allowing me to get experience of talking on the radio, making mistakes, not being perfect, not saying you're perfect, but, but pretty much getting my demo with him doing things. And that was key to me. So Jay, I'm always grateful for the opportunity and allowing me to do that. And then just allowing me to progress in the company. Mm -hmm. I'm a two-part for you. So what was the best advice you received? And then what advice would you give to those looking to get into what you're doing today? I, I would say the best advice I received is you just have to be, you have to be comfortable with doing things that you maybe don't want to do right away and understanding the process of where it will get you later and being okay with you know, maybe I want to be on air, but it's OK to do stuff behind the air at certain points because you can build relationships and you can build connections. So I would say don't be afraid if uh, you're doing something right in the beginning that you don't know quite as well, but you know that it could lead to something in the future for you. And for somebody, I would tell them just grind. I, I, you, I mean, it's, it's like silly and cliche, but you you really do have to enjoy the process of everything. You have to you can't skip steps and you have to understand that. You To get to where you want to go, you have to do things the right way and build up to those goals and be okay with the struggles in, in between. And, you know, obviously I'm still doing that now and still trying to grow and do everything that I can and understand that in the moment, take those little bits of pieces, enjoy those rewards and know that there's a bigger goal ahead. But but trying to skip skip, uh, skip steps and jump to all these other places can be difficult. Uh, seriously, just like enjoy and, and live in the moment with the process of all, of everything. Yeah, no, that's pretty solid. So what have been some of your greatest compliments thus far in your career? Uh, I, I would say a weird one was, so I got to do uh, University of Virginia baseball play-by-play. -play, and this was a game against George Washington early in the season. I mean, nobody's at the at the ballpark. This is not a big game. And UVA baseball has got a solid ballpark. It holds like five, six, seven thousand people for college baseball. It's a good size. It's a good intimate ballpark. A lot of fun. I mean, at this game, there's probably like eight hundred people. It's cold, and 
you know, baseball games are long and they can get boring at times, but this one was rolling. This one was rolling. And there was a pitcher, his name was Will Roberts, was on the mound, and he had a perfect game going. Uh, and I ended up calling a baseball, a UVA baseball perfect game, which to this day was still like the coolest moment because it's it, you, you, like my partner and I wouldn't talk about what was happening because we didn't want to jinx it. And it ended up being uh, Sports Center's number one play on their top 10 from that night uh, was my baseball play by play call. So that was uh, that's something that I always hold uh, near and dear to my heart, which was a lot of fun. And I love UVA baseball program. That was awesome. Hey, have you ever awesome. rewatched that moment? Oh, yeah, I, I've seen it a million times. And then, like, it, it got out at CBS Sports Radio. So the sh- different shows that I was on there would become, like, a drop. Because when I called the play, my voice cracked a little bit. Like, I went, it's perfection! And they'd always make fun of me for that, for the voice cracking. So I have heard that call over and over again as, like, a you know, out-of-context drop for something stupid in sports radio. But, uh, yeah, no, I've heard it. I've seen it. And uh, that's, it's, it's a cool special moment. That's that's pretty funny. So uh, switching it up. So when did you start uh, the Mike Delivers podcast? And what have been some of your best and worst experiences as an Uber East driver thus far? Yeah, so I I was doing um, CBS Sports Radio. I was doing the morning show. And I started doing the morning show. It was a show called um, Geo and Jones. And then Greg, the host, left because he got a job uh, locally at WFAN. So he moved out. And then the show kind of disappeared. And... It was it was a show called Taz and the Moose. And I, at this point, I'd done the show for a year and I've done morning radio producing for four years. And it just got to the point where it was just getting boring and, and like not easy, but it just there was no there was nothing else for me to do. It was like I did the show. I left. That was the end of it. And I had this all because you do morning radio. You get up at 3 a.m. You're home by 12 o'clock. And I had all this afternoon free time. So I wanted to get a second job. And I didn't know what to do. I wanted flexibility. I wanted something where, you know, if I had to go back and do my other job, I didn't have to be handcuffed for it. So my wife brought up the idea of why don't you do Uber Eats? And I was like, I don't want to be an Uber Eats driver. That's silly. Like, I can't do that. I'm not I'm not doing that. So I finally, uh, you know, gave in and did it. And I got to be honest, like I fell in love doing Uber Eats. I loved delivering. I, I enjoyed the part of it that I was used to a set salary, and it was kind of cool that I could put it, good or bad day at CBS, this is what you were making. And it was kind of like the hamster wheel of energy. And I loved the idea that I could go deliver food and make more money on tips and hustle and use my abilities and use my skill of like actually trying harder to make more. And then I just found it to be really mentally relaxing when you could just pick up something from a restaurant, drive to somebody's house, put on the radio, space out for 11 minutes, drop the food off, and that was the end of it. It was kind of like a nice relaxer for me and sort of like therapy. It was awesome. And the other thing I found was, I was like, the crap that happens on the road was incredible. And I kept telling these stories about all these different incidents that I was having as an Uber Eats driver. And then it kind of clicked in my head. I wanted to do a podcast. I didn't know what I wanted to talk about. I'm going to share the stories from the road as an Uber Eats driver. And let me just tell everybody all this wacky crap that I'm seeing. And let's go from there. And it's evolved now where I have guests on and we we go back and forth about food delivery, foods they like to get taken out or delivered to them. And then I share my stories from the road and then try to get some guests to come on and, you know, um, talk about talk, talk about food delivery. And then my wife and I uh, review food that's delivered to us that are kind of some of the specials going on um with uh like chain restaurants and stuff so it, it's been a blast doing it and i never thought when i started being an uber drive uber Eats driver this is the direction it would go but now from doing it um i've done 144 episodes and i've done uh over 2,000 food deliveries i don't know if i could live without it i love doing it that's awesome and that's do you awesome. remember your first delivery i do which is weird because it's the only time that I've ever had free food given to me. So it was the first time I did a delivery and I've done 2,100 something deliveries. This is the only time I've gotten a free item. So I did the first one. I, I just thought this was something that was part of it. It was to the it was the IHOP in Bloomfield, New Jersey. I picked up the order. I was scared out of my mind. I was like, I don't know what to do. How do I open up this app? I got to the IHOP and this is obviously pre-COVID. So you could talk to people, communicate with people, more normal times. And I'll never forget, I get the bag. I get in my car and I get a phone call and it's IHOP saying, we forgot to, we forgot to give part of the order. Uh, we apologize. Come on back. 
So then I come back and there was a strawberry lemonade. So they made me an extra one as well because they felt bad. So I had this strawberry lemonade with me and I was like, okay, free food. Uh, that's the only <laughs> time in two years of being an Uber driver I've ever gotten a free item. And it was the first time that I, uh, first, first, first order I ever did, which was weird. That's, that's pretty funny. Like what a way to start. Totally. Um, so what have been some of your like best and worst experiences thus far? You can sum it up because I'm sure there's a plenty. And obviously on your podcast, you know, we don't have to tell, make you tell the story more than like you normally do. Um, so like my frust- it's funny because I had talked about before the relaxation level, but the things that frustrate me, I'll just I'll, I'll start with this as an Uber Eats driver. And maybe this will be people. Pe- I'm sure now with the pandemic going on, everybody is ordering a lot more food to their house. Even if it's Uber Eats, DoorDash. Uh, seamless or just the local restaurant. If it's late at night and you're ordering food to your apartment or house, make sure you put the light on in the front because it's extremely difficult for the delivery driver when they're going up to so-and-so lane and it's number 96 and you're like looking through the houses. Is that an eight? Is that a six? That's extremely difficult. So that would be my one tip to everybody when they're ordering food late at night, put on the light. The other one, which I think is fascinating, I'm fascinated by this, but if you have, um, you know, like a, you have your door and then you have the door and whatever the hell these things are called, the spring door that comes out in front that just, you know, keeps the wind out or whatever these things are yeah, called. Yeah, screen door. The screen door. That's the word I'm looking for. I'm an Uber Eats professional. I don't even know the name of these doors. So you how much I know. Make sure when you put your, if, if, if uh, you're putting your, the food in front, this is something, this is for the drivers. Don't put it directly in front of the door because then when you open it you push the food over and it falls on the ground make sure it's about six to eight inches to the side of the door so that people can pick it up it's amazing like uh the frustration level i think that people get with that so that's just something uh i'm very passionate about as a a delivery driver that's pretty funny and what is the strangest order you've ever picking up like is it just a you know piece of bread or a slice of cheese like what what is it for you that you think is the strangest thing you picked up uh, I, I would say that I'll, I'll, this is a story I could tell you. I picked up, um, it was an order to get six cookies, six big cookies delivered to a man named John who was in a hotel room. And not that I thought that was kind of odd that just a, a guy would order cookies to him, to himself in a hotel room. And I was like, you know, I don't want to judge people, but that's, I thought even like no food, nothing else, just a couple cookies. So I get to the uh, I get to the hotel and I look around. I thought it was strange. Is there was um, all this New York Giants apparel everywhere? I was like, where are all there's like all these people wearing Giants clothes. And then I'm like looking around. I'm going, oh, this, this is this is the New York Giants team hotel. So I was supposed to go to this guy's door, but he came down the elevator because I guess he was really into getting these cookies. And he's <laughs> six foot seven, three hundred and thirty four pound defensive lineman, one that was at the time on the Giants. His name was John Jenkins. He comes down. I'm like, holy crap. This guy is like, so I give him these cookies. I'm like, I can't believe I'm delivering to the Giants team hotel. And then I didn't know who it was. I mean, I knew it was a giant because he's six foot seven, 340 pounds, and he's wearing New York Giants clothing. So the way the Uber app works, it says John J. So I Google on my phone, John J, figure out it's him. And all of a sudden, he comes running back down to me. And, and he looks at me and he goes, you gave me the wrong cookies. I was like, well, the app doesn't say what the cookies are. It just says the amount number. And I see six here. He goes, yeah, these are M- these are chocolate chip cookies. You had to give me M&M. And he is pissed off at me for giving him the wrong cookies. And I'm trying to explain to him, like, this isn't on me. This is the way the app works. So he's so disappointed. He walks back up and leaves, goes into the elevator. The next day, I emailed the New York Giants, told them the story. They got me media access pass. I went to Giants training camp. I brought John the correct cookies the next day or two days later, interviewed him on the practice field, gave him the cookies, which had melted and congealed together at that point. And he then explains to me, the reason I was so upset is because these were for my kids and I knew they were going to freak out when, when I had the wrong cookie. Oh, so wow. that, oh, was, um, that, was a, that was an order I'll, I'll always remember. And it was cool of the Giants to hook me up that I could interview him after. Yeah, I would say That's like how the delivery process, not the items themselves, but the story definitely falls under that strangest bit. And also kind of leads up to the next question is who's uh, some of your most memorable guests? Um, memorable guests. I loved having on uh, Adam Richmond, the man versus food guy. 
Uh, he came on. He was awesome. Uh, we had a lot of fun. Uh, I enjoyed talking to um, former NBA forward Scott Pollard uh, from the NBA. He had some really cool stories about Vlade Divac and his um, – Vlade Divac does not like to – he eats like a child. So they would go to restaurants, and he would only get cheeseburgers and pasta with butter on it. And I thought that was fascinating just to hear his stories of what it was like behind the scenes uh, eating with with uh, with Vlade Divac. That was, uh, that was fascinating to me. Um, it was cool having the Sklar brothers on, the comedians. This was right before uh, my baby was born, so they had some good advice uh, about what it's like to be a father and how much your life will change. So uh, to name a few, that's been... That's been pretty cool. Uh, so yeah, there's there's a bunch I know I'm not thinking of right now because I've done done a bunch of these interviews, but um, those ones stand out to me right away for sure. Yeah, I think you also had the Mets fan who was upset about the trains as well. Yeah, Frank Fleming. Uh, Frank and Frank and I, who's now with Barstool Sports, um, him and I actually did Uber Eats deliveries together. So I had him in the car and we delivered to people, which was kind of wacky. Uh, got to go to Frank's house. And uh, we did some we did a one on one podcast that was in Frank Fleming's house uh, in Belleville, New Jersey. That was a lot of fun, too. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, last part, um, top five dream guests. And as Chris mentioned before we start recording, you can do dead or alive. Obviously, they should probably be alive when they're in the car with you. But you get the idea. (laughs) I know. I feel you. Well, obviously, I kind of alluded to this earlier, but uh, Joe Harris would be uh, incredible to have on. I've been trying to get Joe Harris on this podcast now, basically since its inception. And I've been back and forth with the PR team, not the Nets, but his agency. And they've been awesome. They have helped me out to get so many other great guests on my podcast. So I've been very thankful for them. They've been they've been great. But Joe is the dream because of my connection at UVA. I have all these questions about what it was like for University of Virginia, Charlottesville food. Then, of course, the Brooklyn food and then the Brooklyn Nets angle. So that one would be tremendous. Um, my best, my favorite Nets player of all time was Drazen Petrovic. Uh, he was the guy that I first started watching the NBA and got just enamored with. So Drazen would be cool. Obviously, unfortunately, Drazen passed away a long time ago in a car accident, uh, which was a tragic death. But I'd love to talk to Drazen. Uh, I think that would be uh, uh, simply incredible. One one guess that I'm going back and forth with with emails, and I'm so close to cracking, but I just can't seem to get over the hump that I'd love to have on is Mark Cuban, and I'm just trying to get him. I think he would be phenomenal for, for a few reasons. He's actually from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and my mom and my wife are from Pittsburgh, so I have all of these Pittsburgh food questions for him that go even deeper than just like what's going on with the Mavs and stuff. So I would love to talk to him about Pittsburgh food that would intrigue me a lot. Uh, I'd be very, very into that. Uh, you know, and I, I think, you know, like some of the Food Network people would just be would just be awesome as well. If I, if I could ever, you know, finagle that uh, Adam Richmond was cool. But like uh, uh, Diners, Drive-Ins and Guy uh, Drive, Diners, Drive-Ins and Dives Guy, Guy Fieri would be super dope. Uh, and then a fifth one, you know, that, that uh, fifth one to get on. Yeah, I, I think Eli Manning would be pretty sweet because he lives in the area uh, and I know that or he lives around the area where I am. And I know there's a lot of restaurants he goes to. So I think it'd be super fly if I could pull off Eli. But I know that one that one be, be, would, would probably be tricky. That's a pretty solid list. I mean, Guy Ferrari, I mean, Triple D is my thing. Like, oh, visit my grandma. That was a show that was always on. Yeah. I'm like, man, I'm just hungry every time I see it. So I respect that list. Yeah, that's a solid list. That's a solid list overall. I appreciate but, all right. that. Let, let's get into some NBA. So let's first, um, when did you watch? When did you begin watching the NBA? Uh, first memory, and what was your favorite team growing up? As we already talked about the Nets, but talk about all that. Yeah, favorite team growing up is the New Jersey Nets. I grew up in Tenafly, New Jersey, which is about 15, 20 minutes from Brendan Byrne Arena, Continental Airlines Arena. And my, I remember my dad's from Los Angeles, so he was a big Lakers fan when he was growing up as a kid. But now in the New Jersey, New York area. Uh, he, he always loved the NBA. So he was like, let's let's go check out some basketball. And it was, you know, a couple hours to get into the city, go to the garden. The tickets were way more expensive. He's like, we've got this arena 10 minutes from our house, 15 minutes from our house. We can get tickets for 15, 20 bucks. Let's go check out the Nets. So the first basketball game I ever went to was Nets versus Bullets. 
I don't really remember it that much, but my first real memory of Nets basketball would be Nets versus Rockets. Drazen Petrovic went off for like 44 points. He had 20 or 24 in the fourth quarter. He was just red hot. That Rockets team was loaded with a Elaj- with Elajuan. I mean, they you know a deep team that was in the title contention. And watching Drazen just go off and score like that, I was like, I am hooked on the Nets. I am all in on them. This is my team. NBA was my number one love, still is. And at that point on, it was like, I'm a Nets fan. I'm hooked. Uh, that those teams, those early teams were good with draws and Kenny and DC obviously didn't pan out the way we all wanted it to. But from that point on, I was hooked on the New Jersey Nets. I feel like a lot of people don't really realize like you're, you said you're from Tenafly. I'm in Emerson. So that's like okay. five away. So I, a lot of people don't really realize how big the New Jersey Nets were when they were in New Jersey to mm-hmm. New Jersey people. Cause all yeah. we got is really the devils. And right. That, that, that's really about it. We don't got too much. So, when you look back on like the whole New Jersey Nets days, like from what from the, like what you said, your first game to literally when they relocated to Brooklyn, like what's a couple things that stand out to you, like legacy wise? I mean, to me, I was a senior in high school, and it was the two thousand one two thousand and two season, and in the, the Rod Thorne got there, and he made the deal where he shipped Stephon Marbury, and the Nets in return got Jason Kidd. And there's some other pieces involved in it, but that was the main one. And I remember being thrilled about the deal, even though Marbury was younger. Kid was basically entering his prime at like 29 years old. Steph was a kid at 23, 24. So they were changing for a five, six year age difference. But they made that deal. They got him. Then on draft night, the great trade to send Eddie Griffin to the Rockets. The Nets got back Brandon Armstrong, Richard Jefferson and Jason Collins. So they started to transform their team. You know, a couple drafts before Kenyon's on the squad, Kerry Kittles, Keith Van Horn, Aaron Williams, Lucius Harris. So the Nets had this depth, and then they got this one guy that came in and put it all together. There were no expectations for this team. They won 26 games the year before. I know Kid at the presser was like, let's try to win 41. Nobody cared. Everybody's talking about the Knicks. And we had season tickets to the Nets. Uh, So, you know, fast forwarding a little bit, we started going to a lot more games, got season tickets. And I remember the first game of the year was Nets versus Pacers. And the game started, and the Nets were terrible. They were down like 15 points. I don't remember exactly the sequence. But all of a sudden, in the second half, like Jason Kidd kicked in, come back, win, beat the Pacers. And I was like, this is weird. We always suck. What just happened? Like, how did they come back and win this game? I remember this. Like, Van Horn had 27. Kidd flirted with a triple-double. And and you don't know those early early stages of a season, you know, teams have wins versus weird teams and you don't really know who's good or who's bad, but you could get a sense that there was a difference with this Nets. And, um, it was, it was that game. I was like, wow, this is going to be a fun year. And then obviously what took off from that standpoint, going to the NBA finals, uh, my biggest memory of that season was I was at the Nets versus Celtics Eastern conference finals game number five. And I remember Boston chipped away, cut it to one with like 10, nine minutes in the fourth quarter. And the Nets went on this crazy like 20 to one run, which was capped off by a Van Horn three in the corner. And that was the first time I experienced like pure joy from my basketball team. And that even though they didn't win the series there, it made it three two. went back to Boston. Another Van Horn shot sealed it so the Nets could go to the finals. Uh, that memory being in the arena Seeing that shot go in, hearing fans scream, it was loud. I was like, this is cool. Uh, th- I, I've waited through a lot of BS for this, and it was a lot of fun. That, 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 was, that was probably my favorite moment of ever going to any sporting event. Mm-hmm. And then what, what, was your, what was your reaction overall when the relocation to Brooklyn was like official? So I was living in Virginia at the time, and I would say in those years as a Net fan, I, would, I don't want to say it was like disconnected more, but it wasn't like – I was so – It was a little bit different. So when they made the move, I was disappointed. I mean, I was upset. As a New Jersey Net fan, I was like, eh, I get it. I understand what they're doing. So a little bit early on, I was frustrated and wasn't as excited. But then I, you know, I'm not saying I didn't watch or wasn't into it, but there was a little feeling of hesitation. Because you mentioned this earlier, Chris, we were talking about like, people don't realize there were actually net fans and people like to make jokes. And we hear, you know, I hear it all the time from the other team in the area about like, Oh, there's no real net fans. I'm like, there are. So there were people that were upset. And you know, I was a little disappointed, but I, I understood 
the greater good of what it meant to get them relocated in Brooklyn. And then obviously, obviously we're seeing, you know, what's, what's going on now. So I, I get it. Yeah, I agree with that. Cause like whenever you see like older Nets fans, like they always like, Oh, they moved to Brooklyn. Okay. I'm a Knicks fan now. Yeah. Like they, they immediately, they immediately like, all right, forget them. I'm Not that. I understand the move. Like for me, I understood the move and all like, don't get me wrong. Like, it's such a more of a pain game than Brooklyn, like, before. Like, you know, right. like, North Jersey, you just cruise down 17. You're right there at yeah. Iza, and you go right down there. So, but, okay, so how would you, in today's today's NBA with the Nets, right, they, you've seen that they, they are tied in mostly to get their reviving their roots back, right, with the throwback uniforms, sure. the court. It's all with Kyrie Irving revolved around him, right, as that poster boy, New Jersey guy. <laughs> so if you were in charge of, I guess you could say, the marketing behind this, how, what other what ways or what methods would you do to kind of reconnect the New Jersey fan base? I think what they're doing is smart going back to the jerseys. You know, it is funny that they're picking the 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 team stunk that year, but the jerseys were gorgeous with the baby blue. They're very, very attractive. Mm-hmm. I think it would be cool if they did a little more with the throwback team to the 0102 team that went back to the NBA finals. I think that would be pretty sweet. I do understand their hesitation early to reconnect with New Jersey. It is funny though, like so I think they're doing everything well, to answer your question. I know that's a cop-out. I think they're doing a great job. I just want to say, I think it's really funny to me, and it makes me laugh now, like bringing back these jerseys, and everybody's like, oh, these are so cool. This, look at those the baby blue jerseys, Derek Coleman, Kenny Anderson. But at the time, it was like the team was a laughing stock. It was a joke. Mm-hmm. You know, like Jared, like you look at a Jared Dudley, like missing free throws every game. That was like the, the, the real Nets. So it's just so funny now they're in Brooklyn, they're going back to it. And I would say like this would this would be the this would be the, the best is if they get to the NBA finals this year, knock on wood, and they get to wear those jerseys for some of the games, I'd be all in on New Jersey Nets apparel in Brooklyn. Maybe there's fans there. Who the hell knows where we're going with it? But yeah, I, I like what they're doing. I like the move. It's smart to make money and you know, the the, the, the it's cool stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's Most funny because a lot of, you know, articles said that people hated those jerseys for that one season. Hmm. And now, you know, right. the Roy- retro thing, I-, I guess, you know, the whole hipster mentality is true. Mm-hmm. Um, one thing I just thought of, what about Swamp Dragons? <laughs> yeah, I would, like, oh. I, I, I don't expect it to ever make it on the court, but no, it's not going to make it on the court. <laughs> it's not going to make it. That is guaranteed money right there. Yeah, that's a that's a very niche that's a very niche Nets thing. The uh, the Swamp Dragons. I mean, I would have been all in. It would have been really weird to see like Jason Kidd throwing alley oops to Kenyon wearing Swamp Dragons uh, material. Uh, you know, I, who knows how serious that really was as a conversation. But I mean, if they could do one game where they're coming out in those jerseys, uh, I would give them a lot of credit, um, and I'd probably want to be one of the seven hundred and two people to buy it. <laughs> I like I don't know like yeah I think I think a lot of there would be a good amount of sales on it like don't get me wrong it's unique <laughs> and all but they got to stay away from those you know it's, <laughs> no, it's you're probably it's, right it's, it's one of those situations but all right the, but to expand from the Nets to the NBA as a total as a whole yeah so you you probably see the NBA obviously they're playing in a pandemic we all knew that there was there's going to be some bumps and they're starting to hit them pretty good so do you think that the NBA is facing a growing problem? Not only, I guess you could say, with COVID and their safety protocols, but feeling pressured to keep the league going rather than hitting a kind of a pause button on it. Yeah, I do. And I think what's mm-hmm. scary, and this is the part that would make me nervous as the NBA, like we're seeing obviously now the reports coming out, games being postponed, teams playing with eight eight players. What would scare me is when we get to a point down the road where there's teams that are out of it, like for I'll just use them as an example. Like what happens when the Detroit Pistons are out of it and you're telling guys that they can't do anything, they can't go out? That would worry yeah. me when we get to that point where it's like, okay, we know that the teams in the mix are going to, uh, you know, hopefully do a good job of staying in, socially distancing themselves, not being out about around town, not when they go to a different city, staying in the hotel, going to the practice court, going to the arena. But what happens when the Detroit Pistons are out of it? What happens when the Sacramento Kings aren't in the hunt anymore and guys are going out? And that would scare me. And that's the part where I'm like, I think now it's bad, but they're they're kind of just managing it and working around it because it's it's easier than the NFL to make up games. It's not like that where you got to crap shoot for crap. But here it's like, 
they can manage around it. But if guys start abusing the power and they start taking things to another level with these teams that are eliminated, that could be a real issue for the NBA in a couple months. Oh, yeah, I totally agree. And you see a couple of players speaking out now. I think it was George Hill. It was like, you can't put me in a, a room for right. X amount of hours or whatever the case is. So it's going to go on to that. It's going to keep transforming. But considering with all, you know, every game, you always see one or two, three players saying, okay, health and safety protocols, they're out. And with contact tracing, whatever the case is, do you think that they should expand the roster and make mm. players more eligible? Or do you think what they should have, like, some type of practice team, like, yeah, there. I think that's a it's an excellent idea. Maybe it's something that's in coordination with G League squads that you can have extra players available. Now, I know then you have to worry about their tracing and make sure that they're in a good place, that it connects all together. Uh, but I think that's an excellent idea to, to have expanded rosters. Maybe maybe it's not five, but you could have one or two guys that are ready to come in because this is not going away. You know, this is going to continue to happen and hopefully as the vaccine gets distributed more and, and people can get safe and healthy and we're, this is all behind us at some point. But I think that's not a bad idea. Expand the rosters, have one or two guys on call, almost like an emergency goalie in hockey that's at the arena, you know, that gets that gets to come in the game. And like, it happens once in a while, but yeah, why not? I mean, it's more just about, at this point, it's just about safety. Uh, and, and I think too, that's why when we look at like the NBA standings right now, there's teams that are winning games that normally wouldn't win games and teams that are losing games. I think this regular season is going to be more look like a baseball season where all the teams are kind of jumbled up and we really won't know anything until the playoffs because there's going to be wins that teams shouldn't get. There's going to be losses that teams shouldn't get. And it's going to just be a wild show until we get to the playoffs. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then do you think looking ahead, right? Do you think that the NBA should look towards going to a bubble for their playoffs and then even to go if you look a couple months more down the line do you think that the olympics are going to happen i I, to answer the bubble question i think we have to wait and see what happens i think this is a fluid situation like why they don't have the second half of the season schedule out yet if things ramp up and get worse yeah then you go to you, you should go to a bubble but if we get to a point in our country where things are better and things are, are looking for progress and we're doing a good job, then I would say let's keep the games. Let's keep the games at an arena. But I, I think to answer it now would be too difficult just based on how this pandemic has changed, how everything has evolved with it. I don't think we know the answer. The Olympics thing, that would scare me. Like that yeah. is a I mean, that is a breeding ground and a covid fest. Like to me, that would scare me. I know I didn't know there's so much money and dollars tied up. But I would I would delay it even more because you're just getting people basically, and I guess I guess in theory it would work if the Olympic Village became like the massive bubble, then I guess it could work. But you couldn't have then fans and people. It would just have to become like the Olympic bubble. That I think would be game. But if you're gonna have people coming in and arenas and and everything that it's been like in the past with the true Olympics, uh, that would terrify me. I mean that would really mm-hmm. scare me. Totally yeah, agree. definitely agree. And the other thing I I, I kind of want them to push back the Olympics selfishly is because the NBA season, they're kind of like they the reason why they did this rush kind of format was they wanted to be ready for the Olympics so that players can participate. And I think, you know, that's another good right. reason you get that out of the way. Maybe all these issues with delaying games won't be as crazy. Back to backs, maybe for the second half of the season will be lessened. So jumping out of that, outside of COVID, what has surprised you about the season thus far? I I would say kind of what I alluded to before is just that teams are winning games that normally don't win games. Teams are losing games that don't normally lose games. It's been weird to see that. Like, I mean, yesterday, for example, and I know they're missing their best player, but like the Knicks beating the Celtics by 30 points, it was like alarming, you know? And it's I was like, I don't like that. I mean, even though it's good for the Nets because – Boston lost, and I guess we're juggling for standings in a home court that it does, it, does it even really matter? But I was like, how are the Knicks beating the Celtics by 30 points? And I you, I think this is the season where it's you can't say because Team A beat Team B, you know, and then Team B beat Team C, that that means Team C will be Team A or whatever, follow my lead. Like the way the Nets played versus the Hawks early in the season, and then I saw the Hawks go out and get demolished by another team. It's oh, the Nets go out and beat the Jazz, and then the Jazz are going out. The Nets beat the Jazz, and then the Jazz go out, and then they they beat somebody that that that's a little worse or better. And the point is, it's just it's almost as if 
it doesn't really matter. And it's just getting your legs and getting good at the right time. But that's been the biggest surprise to me is just how many bad teams are able to be good teams on a consistent basis so far this year. Yeah, I mean, it's slowly starting to even out for some of those teams, as you kind of mentioned. You know, the Hawks are in kind of like a rut. I mm-hmm. mean, as you mentioned before, bad team beats good team. Does that mean the other? if you beat the bad team, are you right. a good team? So we have that with tonight's game. You know, the Bucks were beaten by the Knicks early on in a big shocker, and now we're playing the Bucks. So And we beat the Knicks in between that time. So by that logic— right. But we'll, we'll see, you know, we're kind of depleting the bench, but we'll get to that in just a moment. So do you feel like the rush start of the season and increased back-to-backs led to more injuries? You know, we didn't really have – Steve Nash always says, you know, we don't have a lot of practice, and we'll talk about him a little bit as well. But I think at times I feel like this isn't just an extension of the preseason. No, it, it is. I, I mean, I look at, like, the, the Dinwiddie injury was rough to see, and that one went down. And I, I, I wouldn't be surprised – I'm actually surprised there hasn't been more injuries – considering the circumstance like I saw Kevin Kevin Durant logging 40 minutes the other night uh in the game versus um Orlando and I'm like should he be playing 40 minutes it's like terrifying uh so I'm 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 surp- like I see the Dinwiddie injury and that's scary and this really is practice time for everybody I know they had the what 10 days of practice but th- th- so what I mean it's new players new faces no practice time in between games. You just knock on wood, there's not going to be any more serious injuries. And we've seen some that have occurred throughout the league, like the Markel Fultz thing sucks. I mentioned Dinwiddie, TJ Warren. There has been injuries. You know, it'd be interesting to go back and look at previous years and kind of compare what happened early on in the year with those kind of injuries because it's part of the game and it will happen. Uh, but yeah, man, there's no practice. They're learning on the fly. And th- like I said before, it's just a strange season with everything. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think that relates to how the NFL started, where a lot of teams right. would blame the Jets uh, field for injuries. But I, I think, you know, the NFL did, a, unlike the NBA, did a poor job, you know, explaining what would happen. Not that the NBA was, you know, clear and honest that when we're starting, get conditioning. Right. And then with COVID, you know, it's so hard to practice. But I think that is um, an unfortunate thing. And I hope I mean, there's no better way of saying this, but I hope that if their injuries get out of the way now, but not that I want any for that right. matter. So, not it, it, it's it sucks. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then I guess we, let's move to some Brooklyn Nets. So I, we'll, we got a leader off of James Harden, right? So, do you what you, overall, right? You think this is a good trade or a bad trade for the Nets? I think it's a good trade. I will say when it happened, I was really upset. I was I was pissed. Uh, obviously, it goes without saying when you give up 110 draft picks. Oh. I don't have to remind the audience about what happened with that last time. Obviously, very different trade, different component with it. Um, I think there's something about seeing guys that were homegrown n- players that you drafted that developed and became not all-stars, but a tier below all-stars and with Levert and with Allen. It was fun to watch them grow, and it was like they were part of the team. Like seeing Jared Allen coming up this week and seeing him in a Cavs jersey, it is not quite the same feeling, but it's like if a girl breaks up with you and then you see her out with somebody else and you're like, we've had so many years together. We were such a special item. How could you be there in Cleveland? You were in love with me. What's going on here? So I know when I see Jared Allen out in the Cavs jersey and you know, knock on wood for Karis LeVert, with the Pacers, that's going to be irritating. So my initial reaction was like anger on that front. The more and more I thought about it and like let it digest in my head, I realized how good James Harden is. And I think there's been a lot from the media standpoint to pick on him because of his, in- his uh, inefficiencies in the postseason has been glorified. And obviously we know how bad he's been. And then to start this season, he was a total jackass the way he performed and acted in Houston to get his butt out of there. So I understand that. But as time continued and I started to rationalize in my head what they were getting and how this could come together, I started to feel less anxious about the importance of depth and realizing that when you pair superstars together, you could make something special and there will be somebody available down the line, whoever it is that will come in at center because you know DeAndre Jordan can't move anymore. He's a shell of what he was. The Nets obviously need some depth at the five. They'll find somebody that'll be available. It always happens. So initially upset, didn't think it was a good move. Now, you know, I'm all in. Like, I have no other options. It's like, all right, here's the guy. Here's James Harden. 
here's my dude, you know, taking step backs. The things I thought were so annoying from him. Now I'm like, all right, 13 for 15 from the line. That's what we do when we got James Harden. And I, I, the instant chemistry he had with Kevin Durant got me pretty excited, even though they were playing an Orlando team on a back-to-back that has injury issues, who can't score, who scored, and we saw the defensive problems. You couldn't help yourself but get excited after watching that game. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then when you look at Karis LeVert, right, obviously you had that very terrifying news that there was a small mm-hmm. mass found by his left kidney, right? So obviously we could all agree that, hey, this was a blessing in disguise for him, right? Sure. Because they, they, he wouldn't have had a physical if not until right. next, till the beginning of next season. So when you look at, like you said, with Karis LeVert and Jared Allen, their homegrown products start from the draft. They've moved all the way up to mostly has their name floating in all-star I right. guess, selection material, right? So now with them out the door and everything, kind of the roster here, do you think that the Nets currently have enough to contend for a championship and win it all? They need another, they need somebody at the five. They need a little mm-hmm. more depth there. That That is for sure. I mean, I've loved what I've seen from Reggie Perry in the brief sample size. I was like, where did this come from? The guys can finish around the basket. He made a three-point shot. He's got a big body. Uh, you know, Nick Claxton's out, and we haven't seen him all year. That'll be intriguing to see when he comes back, what he can give this team. He showed he showed some signs of playing well at the end of, uh, or in the middle of last year. I was disappointed he didn't go to the bubble. He would have been one of those players that's developing, would have been really beneficial for him, would have been fun to watch. So we haven't seen Claxton play basketball in what it feels like since February or some, something crazy like that, whenever the pandemic hit, or March. Um, so... With that said, I think they need to add a piece. And from there, yeah, I think they can do it. Will they? I mean, you know, we've seen the Bucks issues in the playoffs. I'll be curious to see the Nets versus Milwaukee tonight, although you can't take too much away from it long term. It'll just be fun. Um, but, I mean, for them, you look through the Eastern Conference, and it's like, you know, Philly's got their problems. and Embiid will give the Nets fits, obviously. But you see their inefficiencies and their issues. I don't trust the Celtics. I know when they get Tatum back, but I just don't know if they have enough firepower to go up against the Nets. Um, the Heat, even though how great they were last year, they're struggling, and they don't seem to be the same team. You know, the Milwaukee Bucks, to me, are are the guys, um, and they've had issues in the playoffs, but their size, their defense, and now with, you know, the, their ability to shoot the three, I mean, that that is the team that would scare me in the East. And then obviously, you know, the big dogs out west and the Clippers or Lakers. But to answer your question, it's they they can do it. You know, will they? You know, uh, that's a well, we don't have a fast forward button, so we'll find out. <laughs> we have to wait. We have to wait and enjoy the ride in the meantime. But mm-hmm. uh, but how do you feel? What is your judgment or assessment so far of Steve Nash's like coaching ability? Completely confused. Sometimes I have like I I I am maybe I have Kenny Atkinson like memories. But, like, Mm -hmm. seeing Kevin Durant play 40 minutes is odd. I'm used to, like, D'Angelo Russell leading the team in minutes with 29.6. And we would be like, he's not playing the fourth quarter. Spencer Dinwiddie is. So it's weird to see him giving the stars time to play and giving them actual minutes. That's been weird. The DeAndre Jordan thing early in the season when he went with him over Allen was bizarre. Uh, Bruce Brown not getting run, then getting run, then being taken out was strange the one thing i do like that he does and i haven't seen a lot of coaches do this i like that he puts in his shooters with like four or five seconds left at the end of quarters to come back into the game and he's not scared to do that he'll be like you know what i know durant's sitting let's bring him in for one play let's bring joe harrison for one play uh and for him that he got into the mix in 10 games or whatever 14 games into the season kyrie irving's missing james harden's been dealt this everything uh, Durant contact tracing out for a couple of games. There's been a lot thrown at him, and I will say he does seem to be able to handle that and uh, seems calm about it. Maybe some of his answers with the media have been strange, and he's been called out on that. But I don't think he's phased or cares. Uh, I'll be curious to see how the rotations look with Kyrie back, and I also liked how we split the minutes with Durant and Harden to make sure that James was on the second unit because of now that second unit not having as much firepower. I did like that too. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And you actually touched on two of the follow-ups I was going to ask you. So first, what do you think it's all going to come together when Kyrie comes back? Do you think that these big three will be able to kind of do the sacrificing, you know, whether it's, okay, this guy gets 
his buckets tonight, this guy gets his buckets tonight, whatever, however they want to split it up. And my second follow-up for that, do you th- I always thought that going into this, after that James Harden trade became official, that Joe Harris was going to be the leader of the second unit. Because mm. I don't think there would be any other real player that could be the poster boy of that second unit. Because I don't think the stars, despite starting and all, you know, the, obviously the big three are going to start. But I doubt that Steve Nash really designates one of them primarily to just be that second unit leader, come in, whatever the case is, aside from staggering the minutes. Uh, to answer the Joe part, I think they just love the idea of him being out there with those three guys because of how many open shots he'll get is going to be ridiculous. And he's shooting the three-pointer right now at 50% this season. An underrated part about Joe is I think nationally everybody thinks Joe, three-point shooter, but his ability to finish around the basket and his ability to hit the mid-range and defend. So I think they like Joe there on that standpoint. But I wouldn't be surprised if it was mixed up where he's then getting moments with the second unit in some splits until they get to the fourth quarter. Uh, the Kyrie thing, I have no idea. And I and I would be lying if I said I did. He's looked awesome on the court. He's played defense. He's hustled. He's done everything brilliantly on the court when he's been there. But who the hell knows what's going on in his mind? Who the hell knows what he's really thinking? And it does terrify me if Harden and Durant, and, and I know this sounds like, 14-year-old kids, but it's like if Harden and Durant are gelling, Kyrie could seriously get jealous, and that could be like a mm-hmm. real problem. So I it has the potential to be awesome. I don't know how they're going to figure out the ball handling. Harden looked good as a distributor. What does that mean for Kyrie? I don't know. I have so, There's so many questions for these three guys to play together that I just don't think can be answered until we see it. But I do think if they all sacrifice, I think it could work. When people say there's only one ball, I hate that. I was like, yes, there's only one ball, but these three guys are brilliant. And if they want to coexist, they can make it work. The issue isn't the one ball. The issue is they don't have a center, and DeAndre Jordan, the skeleton of him, is walking up and down the court and getting abused by Nikola Vucevic. That's the issue that this team's going to have. Uh, so I want to see it play out, but I think if they sacrifice and they they believe in themselves and they know there's a greater good of winning a championship, I absolutely think they can make it work. Yeah, I think so, too. I mentioned this. In, sorry, Chris. Uh, I mentioned this another night in one of my tweets. A question is, you know, when Kyrie comes back, let's say they're all playing the thing, you know, you start them, you close with them. But during the game, what I would do is either, hard, it, you know, you take out one of them early, let's say six minutes in, you take right. out Kyrie and it's Harden and KD. Then about two minutes or so left. You start take uh, you take out KD, let Harden play some more into the second, or something like that. Right. You know, you mix and match, whatever. Sure. So that KD is kind of that um, glue, glue guy. He's the duo. So if you do a Harden KD or you do a Kyrie KD, and then at times, you know, because at least one of them is going to be on the floor at all times. You know, you have Kyrie Cook solo, or you have Harden Cook solo. So you don't necessarily have to do. A, Kyrie KD obviously you want to see what that's like I'm sorry Kyrie Harden see what that's like without KD sure. on the court but I think the best way of doing it is if there's going to be a minimum of two mm-hmm. that KD is one of them yeah and that and that's and that's the key because it's like if you said to me this was you know Kyrie Irving was the sixth man all of a sudden you have a, a different view of this team like oh wow they have a lot of depth they, you're bringing Kyrie off the bench so it's it's really less about who starts the game, but it's more about who finishes the game and about who, what they can do in between. It's like, okay, yeah, that's your starting five, but we saw in the game versus Orlando. Reggie Perry was in the fourth quarter, and then they went to Jeff Green. So that doesn't really matter as much. So uh, agreeing with your point, yeah, mix and match. Make sure Durant's with one of them. Swing it all together, and then you can just stretch out those minutes so it's not all bulked together like we saw in the beginning of the year when Kyrie and Durant were always together. There's going to have to be mixing and matching and making sure that there's a star on the court at all times, and then you feel good about it. Like what we saw in Orlando, Harden with the second unit, and the team stayed in the game, stayed close, and then pulled away late. They weren't had being led by Landry Shamit, you know, who need to get the minutes. They had a guy out there in Harden who obviously could do what he can do. Mm-hmm. And my last question for you on the Nets is, as a Nets fan and everything, obviously, you know, personal reasons are personal reasons at the end of the day, right? For any absence. So what, what do you think of Kyrie's absence as a full? And do you think that it is true or do you think that the Nets – um, the reports about the Nets being frustrated or starting to grow that frustration with Kyrie are starting to take in more effect. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I'll say this because uh, I Kyrie lives in West Orange, and I deliver mm-hmm. Uber Eats for West Orange area all the time. I keep having visions of delivering Uber Eats to Kyrie Irving's house and like waiting for his name to pop up on my phone as he was <laughs> away from the Nets. Hasn't happened yet, but I understood him missing the game if he was going out there for a belief in something that happened, uh, some heinous actions in this country. I understand and I respect that. It comes to a point, though, if you're going to disappear for multiple, multiple, multiple games, not only more or less to the fans, whatever. I mean, we want to know because we love our team. But I'm more interested in, like, how about the guys, your teammates, the ones like what is Kevin Durant thinking when his guy isn't there for him? And how much impact did that have on having the James Harden trade? So that would frustrate me. At some point, you have to be held accountable for your actions as an adult going to the workplace. And I understand He's different than anybody else because of being a superstar athlete. I understand that. But there has to be some accountability. You owe it to the people around you. You owe it to the Nets. If you don't want to be there, then if you, I mean, you have a contract, but if, if you're out of it, you're out of it. But you have to let everybody know. You have to let the team know. I'm sure at this point, obviously, they know what's going on. And then just the bad look of having the birthday party, which is funny, too, because, like, you know, Kyrie Irving's having a birthday party with his sister and dad and it's cakes. I mean, it's the most casual, normal, boring birthday party that anybody could have and not your stereotypical NBA birthday party where you're out at strip clubs, you're drinking all night. And it's like, oh, NBA players, look at they, they, look what these superstars do. He's having the most boring birthday parties given. But the timing of not being in a mask, being away from your teammate, it just all looks so bad. So I could completely understand the Nets' frustration at this point. But, you know, Kyrie's a dynamic player. Kyrie's a genius. Kyrie's an unbelievable guy and a, and a, and a part of this team they need. So, uh, you know, he, he'll he'll be allowed to – I mean, there's, there's going to be no repercussions, but we'll see what happens. It would scare me, playoff game, Nets versus Pacers, second round, Kyrie Irving's disappeared, and Karis LeVert's just killing the Nets. Like, mm-hmm. I would be worried – if Kyrie says, you know what, I want to split here in the middle of May or June or whenever the hell the playoffs are going to be going on because I'm not feeling it. That would worry me. Yeah, I think those are fair points um, before Chris gives his insight on that as well. Um, I do think what, you know, it's tough to really gauge what's going on. You know, you saw we kind of understood how difficult it was when his grandfather passed away. When he's on the Celtics, he completely shut down. So maybe time with his family, you know, two of the most important birthdays. And his family, you know, maybe that was the thing, although it's tough for a lot of people to see that because of, you know, pandemic. Not a a lot of people can celebrate birthdays, not even to a fraction of that capacity. And then obviously what's going on in the country, current events, um, which we won't dive into, you know, that has also been um, kind of a, put it mildly as possible, a drag. But one Mm -hmm. thing you mentioned is, you know, delivering West Orange and one of these days you may run into Kyrie Irving. What do you think he would order? Like, what do you think? A uh, Kyrie Irving order would be, and then I'll let Chris give his insight and thoughts on what you talked about before that. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I have I, I have no idea now. Kyrie, he's I know there's a lot of net players that are in the vegan gimmick or vegan game and like to do that, but you know I I don't know if Kyrie Irving is there. So if I'm if I'm picking up for Kyrie Irving, I'm thinking that I'm going to one of the solid Italian restaurants in the area, and I'm like. I'm bringing Kyrie all of this Italian food, and he's gearing up, and that's what that's what uh, that's what Kyrie and the fam is getting. But I'm I'm hoping one day uh, that does happen. Uh, it has not, but it, but there's so many West Orange deliveries, it it literally jumps in my mind every single time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then I got one, my final question for you on the net side of things is: Are you just mentally prepared to see Jared Allen twice next year, next week in a Cavs <laughs> uniform? Yeah, because I don't I think am. a lot of people are. I'm ready for it. I know it's it's the Wednesday and the Friday. It's a seven o'clock. It's a seven thirty. Both of them in Cleveland. Not that it really makes a difference because I guess if you work in the arena, you get to say hi to JA. But that's about it. But it's going to be weird. And I know what's going to happen is him and Drummond are going to destroy the Nets on the glass. Like I don't know how they are going to get rebounds on those two games. So they better pray they make some shots. And, you know, I'm thinking maybe Andre Drummond will be bought out at some point and maybe he'll be a Brooklyn net. That'd be pretty cool. But yeah, I'm, I'm terrified for Wednesday and Friday, the offensive and defensive rebounds plus minuses versus the nets is going to be terrifying. Well, it's a slaughter. You know, they also have McGee, they have Nance yes. jr. 
Yes. I don't know if Thon gets any minutes, but like right there, big two big two those two of those players are potential either buyout or <laughs> potential nets. In, inexpensive <laughs> trade. Yeah. yeah, inexpensive <laughs> trade partners. And one thing, you know, I I, I still am not gonna, ever gonna get over this. Uh, the Landry Shamit was sh- trying to be shot for a first round pick, and that first round pick could have yeah. kept Jared. Like I just saw wow, that. Wow, that was wow. depressing. But like I don't even know if we would have been able to afford Mr. Creation, But I just had to bring that up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I saw that report, and that was kind of, you know, hindsight 2020. It's impossible to be perfect at everything. Sean Marks clearly has done a good job. There's been a couple of deals that have not panned out for him. Uh, the Alan Crabb thing didn't work out, uh, a notably one. But then, like, it's funny, too. Some of the smaller deals that he's done have, have been huge. Drafting Reggie Perry late, and then this this Bruce Brown deal for Musa seems to be a, be a home run for him. But, yeah, hindsight 2020, it's like... That sucks. And he's still been able to flip, you know, some of those things, you know, um, Alan Crabb, you know, cap space for this, yep. for the clean sweep. So, you know, mm-hmm. one, you know, the Sean Marks ex- experiment, whatever you want to call it, you know, let's look at it a decade from now to give it its yeah. full mm-hmm. view. That's true. Yeah, especially with all the uh, these picks. Um, and if they can re-sign Harden and Durant long term, um, that that's going to be critical in uh, in this team's in this team's future not just this year and the one after but moving forward because if they lose those guys and they don't have the picks uh get ready for it mm-hmm. yeah that's why buckle up that's what, that's what i've told people <laughs> before you can, you can think about the good stuff now but seven years is a long time in the nba i know so it's it's scary but all right to wrap it all up what's your well, who's your championship winner i know obviously there's so much things that that could happen from now till sure. then. covid injuries you know you know this is a crazy season overall so a championship winner and then who, who's like a sleeper team like someone that you would expect to like not win it all obviously but like you know make that extensive run that a lot of people aren't really seeing coming well if i i can't come on here and not say it's the nets uh i gotta do it <laughs> i mean i got i gotta say nets and probably i mean i know it's simple but yeah the lakers i mean the clippers have looked good so far in this season the lakers have looked great but it's hard to go against lebron james and bet against them and what we saw from paul george last year it's it's tough to just envision the lakers losing that series but i'm gonna have to go nets versus lakers classic series seven game series kevin durant nets down 101 well, more than this 121 to 120 six seconds on the clock durant dribbles up Hits the jumper. Nets win the championship in Los Angeles with six thousand fans in the in the arena because we can socially distance and everything's doing a little bit better with the vaccine. So I like the Nets to get that done uh, in the Eastern Conference. I always I'm a big believer in the Pacers. I I, I, I obviously you know my feelings on Lavert. I think Malcolm Brogdon. He's another UBA guy. Is one of the most underrated players in the NBA. He was actually oh, the yeah. rookie of the year the year he was selected, but. He's just a guy. He's an extremely good defender. Uh, he gets other players involved. He's clutch with his shooting. I like Malcolm Brogdon a lot. I like Indiana, and I like their size with Sabonis. He is a pain in the ass. There are guys that you think of, and I'm like, always torture the Nets. Josh Smith in Atlanta, Sabonis in Indiana. Basically, any power forward from the Central Division just kills the Nets forever, it feels like. But I, I like Indiana, and I, I'll be curious to see once – Karras, you know, gets back and is healthy and gets on the court, what he looks like. And I, for Karras, I think that'll be a great opportunity for him that he doesn't have to deal with just all of And he handled it so well. But the nonsense in Brooklyn with Kyrie, Durant, on the bench, starting, coming off the bench, he'll just be able to play. And I think that'll be a really good situation for him. I think that's a very good sleeper. I was talking to someone last night that the Pacers are one of the three teams that would probably give the Nets the most fits, along with the healthy and competent 76ers and the Bucks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, the think, size I, I think the Celtics right now are looking like they would probably be a fifth seed team, at least in the mentality of giving us personally a fit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I yeah, wouldn't worry about Boston as as, as much um, with because – the size factor, and I, I just don't buy into Brown as the the second star there. But we do. I, I guess we have to see. You know, Kemba came back, played a little yesterday versus the Knicks. Uh, Kemba at full strength obviously makes a big difference. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because heading into the season, my two sleepers are going to be the Hawks and the Suns. Those are going to be my mm-hmm. two sleepers. Suns been good. Suns has been really good, and I feel like Chris Paul is definitely going to take that team to another level because he, he's one of those players that go to a spot. You know, he's the veteran. He can still ball. 
And overall, he just really transfer, transforms that whole franchise into, like, okay, 500 team, a little above that. And the Hawks, like, they got a steal number number six pick. I don't know. I can't pronounce his name, but the guy from USC, he's really good. Been watching him since high school. Mm. I have a lot of high praise in him. I think he's going to do really, really good. But, like I said, like, my championship winner, I'm thinking to, I had the Lakers in the very beginning. Now with the James Harden, you know, now in Brooklyn and everything, I, I think the Nets are going to they're gonna be one of those teams that put it all together for those 16 games in the playoffs. I think mm, they're just having their so. fun now. Yeah. They're just doing their thing, and then 16 games, boom, they're, they're in the go. I like so, it. That, I have to see how we fill out a roster before I get to that conversation. But la- before the Harden trade, I was like, next year is our year. But now I'm like, it kind of has to be this year, although I'm not confident yet. But I, I – hey – if you guys are, maybe I should be too. <laughs> hey, got no, you got no other choice now. You got no other choice. <laughs> yeah. Nothing better, dri- nothing better than James Harden dribbling. I'm all for it. Let's do oh, it. Oh yeah, I just, I just have to cringe a little bit every flop and try to get used to his fashion sense. But anyways, uh, thanks again for joining us, Mike. Uh, really appreciate you taking your time out of your morning, John. Thank you, guys. Chris and I. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. if you could just plug in your uh, social media, where to find you, talk about your podcast, plug it in a bit more. Yeah, and, uh, Chris will take us home. Cool. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. Um, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Mike Delivers Pod. Um, and then my two podcasts that I've been I've been working on, the Mike Delivers Podcast, where I share some of like what I said before, my my stories from the road as an Uber Eats driver, get to, get to go behind the scenes of what it's like delivering food in a pandemic, and then talking to some celebrities uh, about food delivery, and then Bad Weather Fans, which is me. And uh, a Nick fan, Alex Benesowitz, him and I go back and forth uh, talking Nick's Nets, uh, which is a weird podcast to do because um, when the Knicks win, it's really difficult to get up and talk about the Knicks. And then when the Nets lose, it's difficult. But that has been something that I think has pushed me and evolved me in trying to talk sports. And uh, that's something else. If you're if you're into the Nets and Knicks, I highly recommend. But yeah, Bad Weather fans and Mike Delivers podcast. Uh, I appreciate uh, allowing me to share the plugs there. Thank you, guys. Mm-hmm. Of course. And, well, guys, we'll have all that in the description below. But remember to send over any suggestions, questions, comments, or thoughts on any of our content by sending an email to wingspanpodcast at gmail.com. And do not forget to follow us on our social media channels. But most importantly, make sure you subscribe to our podcast on your preferred listening service. And as for next time, stay classy, take care, and wear a mask. <laughs>